I call Jerry Carl. Speaker, and I want to begin by giving my thoughts uh, to everybody who's been forced to self-isolate, um, and especially those people who uh, don't have family or friends to call uh, and are self-isolating. Uh, my thoughts are with them uh, at this time, and I want to extend my condolences as well to everybody who have um, tragically lost their lives as a result of this um, deadly, dangerous virus. Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly frustrated that, once again, this executive uh, has had to wait for Boris Johnson to act when international advice was to take action. Two weeks ago, the World Health Organization criticised Boris Johnson's do-nothing herd immunity approach, and when Europe was dubbed the epicentre of the pandemic, Boris Johnson did not want to act, so the executive uh, didn't. It's worth remembering uh, the executive refused to close schools, despite uh, the, the fact that all around us, schools and workplaces uh, were closing their doors in the interest of public health. They were miles ahead uh, in terms of taking action. And it's worth remembering as well that the Minister of Education snarled at me last week, this day last week, when I suggested that schools uh, should be closed down. It has taken two weeks of public outrage, of international criticism, of pressure from NH uh, NHS staff to get us toward a more serious shut shutdown, <clears throat> and, still, and still there are not enough measures in place to protect the vulnerable from COVID-19. I wonder, could the Health Minister tell us why we are still refusing to test people in their hundreds and thousands? Straight through testing centres are being set up in the South, but someone with two or more symptoms here uh, cannot get a test. It simply boggles the mind. I wonder also, could the Minister uh, tell me why the Executive has not moved to requisition private health care facilities and equipment into public use to resolve the shortages in the health service? A company outside Belfast, I am sure as people will know, uh, are charging £120 for a testing kit, and another uh, in the south sells ventilators uh, internationally, but we have shortages uh, across this island. Where is the effort to take over production of personal protective equipment? to make sure our health service is properly protected. Uh, profit shouldn't trump public health at any time, but especially at this time. And finally, were the, uh, the way-ranging financial measures to protect those who have lost their jobs or will be unable to support themselves because of this virus. Five weeks on universal credit waiting list or basic statutory pay, uh, neither is good enough. Rent freezes, mortgage freezes, ban on evictions, utility bills being frozen. These are the real emergency powers that should be enacted. Instead of taking these steps, this executive is quickly moving to emergency powers to simply force people indoors. Mr. Speaker, we and people before profit will happily back the progressive proposals within this bill, for example, to recruit uh, to the health service. But this legislation does not include real measures which would protect workers, the self-employed and the vulnerable, and this has been a problem all along. Indeed, much of this legislation seems to be primarily aimed at coercing people instead of providing the financial provisions to allow people to stay at home. And I share the concerns of Amnesty International in, in relation to this legislation, Mr. Speaker, who have said that they are, and I quote, broad, serious, and potentially invasive powers granted to public health officials, constables, and immigration officers, end quote. In the short time that we had uh, to look at this legislation, I attempted to amend uh, this legislation to reduce many of these elements because we think it's wrong to potentially detain people when employers are still able to force people to go to work. And in my experience, Mr. Speaker, people want to socially distance them themselves and socially isolate to protect their, themselves and their families. But we urgently need financial security from government for those people and not simply state coercion. Powers such as attainment should never be considered before financial security has been secured. And how can the executive contemplate detaining people if they haven't even secured provisions that would allow thousands of construction workers to stay at home, or agency workers, or the self-employed, uh, for that matter? And further, these emergency powers would potentially be conferred for two years a massively draconian shift which we attempted to amend, so that this Assembly would have to ratify these measures every two months. Basic accountability to ensure extreme measures would not remain in place longer than they absolutely had to. And I think it is regrettable, it's deeply problematic, Mr Speaker, that those amendments did not make it to the floor today. And I would urge the Executive to bring these powers back uh, for regular ratification to the floor of this Assembly to ensure 
oversight against any potential uh, abuses of power. If Westminster can we look at these powers every few months, why can't we? And that's something uh, that I think other members have raised already uh, today. And in order to ease uh, some concerns in relation to the detention aspects in this bill, I want to specifically ask the Health Minister uh, that he make a, a public statement uh, declaring that his department will not pass on the details of any migrants to the Home Office during the crisis, in line with the recent Irish Government statement uh, to that uh, effect, a similar statement by the Government in the South, and also that staff receive guidance, updates uh, to confirm asylum seekers and those without status here are able to access free health care in relation to COVID-19. And if he does so, uh, I'm sure it will provide some important assurances to those members of our community who are vulnerable uh, and often marginalised. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute uh, to and thank the incredible, brave, compassionate workers in our frontline services. We will be forever indebted uh, to them for putting themselves uh, and their families second, and the health of our communities first. We cannot thank you enough, and I only hope the importance of your work is never again rewarded with lesser wages and conditions that you do not deserve. Thank you. I call Claire Sugden. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Minister for his work.